Well, welcome to our weekly series of talks, History at Home. The Australian National Maritime Museum acknowledges the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians of the Bamu and the Badu, the lands and waters on which we work. We also acknowledge all traditional custodians throughout Australia and pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders past and present. And personally, it's very important for me to acknowledge that I am on Gadigal country. My name is Dana Fletcher, and I'm Head of Acquisitions at the National Maritime Museum. Again, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this latest History at Home presentation about the Titanic, and it's a name that looms large in cultural imaginings about the sea. Presenter Inga Scheel will take us on a journey through a little explored aspect of that story, a theme that very much evokes and echoes the aspirations of the famed White Star Liner, the fashions of the late Belle Epoque. What did the passengers pack and wear on that voyage, a voyage they anticipated to be seven days long in a chilly April in 1912, nearly 110 years ago? Well, Inga is going to unpack their bags. She will introduce you to passengers, including fashion stylist Edith Russell, then Rosenbaum, who in a 1970 interview remarked about her escape from the sinking ship, quote, how do you expect me to get off of anything with this thing I've got on? I'm a prisoner in my own skirt. I can't even walk, much less get up that rail and jump across that ocean. Oh no, not me. I'm not an acrobat. So we'll hear more about Ethel Edith Rosenbaum. Our presenter, Inga Scheel, has worked at the museum for more than 17 years, most recently as an assistant curator. The Titanic is one of her passions, as is fashion. She's published and lectured widely on both subjects, and in 2012 published a biography of Titanic officer Harold Lowe the same year she was honoured to participate in the Titanic Memorial Cruise from Southampton to New York to mark the 100th anniversary of the disaster. So today, over the course of the next 40 minutes, Inga is going to share her research and her passion. After that, we'll have a Q&A, a question and answer session for 15 minutes. And um, if you'd like to participate, any questions arise, please type them. Um, click on the icon uh, at the bottom of your screen and type them in and we'll get to as many of them as possible uh, after the talk. So please welcome Inga. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dana. And I'd like to just start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking to you, the Darug people. Now, I know that a lot of our, our audience, just as I have, have a long history with Titanic. And of course, one of the questions that comes up very frequently is why are we still interested in a shipwreck that happened over a hundred years ago? Um, and the answers are many and varied. I mean, there are so many wonderful stories that we're still researching and investigating. Um, we know, for example, that the, uh, the six Chinese passengers have recently come to the foreground. And there's stories about the Syrians on board, there's stories about the Jewish passengers, a lot of stories that have been rather, um, rather neglected. You'd assume that with so many volumes written about this subject that we had investigated everything that there was to tell but we're still uncovering and there's still more research to be done. And of course, there are people that are interested in the technical side of the ship. And if you ever want to start a fight online, go into one of the uh, social media groups and uh, start uh, ask a question about whether the centre prop had three or four blades. And I tell you what, watch the fireworks start, um, start flying. But the other thing we're also fascinated in, it's for the same reason that we like, um, we like television and social dramas, we're intrigued by that upstairs, downstairs world that we see in the, um, in the social classes, first, second and third, and the cross-section of European society that, that, uh, that they represent. Um, and I know that um, people are endlessly fascinated by how they lived, how they, um, 
how they move through their days. And of course, fashion is such a large component of that social history. It tells us so much about the lives of the people that we, um, that we uh, are researching. And it's very, um, it's very interesting too. It's, it's both a distant uh, past, but it's close enough that we can still relate to it. And of course, what we're going to see today as we look at Titanic fashion is that in a sense, we're bridging the Victorian and early Edwardian period and we're looking forward in some respects to the modernity that was introduced in the 1920s. So I'll take you on. So what was appropriate for an ocean voyage in 1912? Now, previous to this, really, um, as one newspaper article put it, um, you had to wear your oldest clothes and you could pretty much write them off at the end of the voyage. This is still an age of unpaved roads and, of course, um, steam combustion engines. And uh, steam, if you've ever encountered it, uh, gives off not only a very strong odour, it also, uh, also um, emits a lot, of, uh, a lot of flecks of dust and particulate matter. And so people tended to wear very dark, heavy travelling clothes. But by 1912, that's beginning to change. And as that same newspaper article indicated, essentially... Some of the big ocean liners had become floating hotels at sea. And we see that here in these advertising brochures from the 19, uh, from uh, the launch of the um, Olympic class in 1911. On the left there, we have the um, grand staircase, the first class grand staircase. We have a, a woman wearing a suit who has obviously taken a turn out on the decks and she's just returning. And down there we have a woman wearing an afternoon dress and a man dressed in a lounge suit. Now, they could really essentially be in any hotel um, in Europe or America where a woman is uh, returning from having been on a stroll in the streets and two men are casually inhabiting an indoor space. And we have this depiction of the second-class promenade. And again, people are dressed weather appropriately. You can see, for example, the um, strolling figure there in the centre. She's wearing a fur boa. We know that several women, and tragically, a couple of them were recovered with bodies, but we know that women were wearing those on the voyage. Um, of course, we have concessions to uh, the weather on the North Atlantic. We have um, women there on steamer chairs with rugs. But essentially, we're looking at the sort of clothing that you'd find as weather appropriate wear, even ashore. So I'll just start by introducing you to one of the passengers on board. This is Lucy Duff Gordon. She was born in 1860. Um, she was born in 1863 uh, in England. She spent much of her childhood in Canada before returning to Jersey. And in 1893, in the breakup of her first marriage, she married. She um, uh, she started her own um, uh, fashion house. Um, it took off very successfully, and by the time period we're talking about, she was looking at branches in, uh, she had branches in New York, she was also expanding into Paris, and she would in time branch off into Chicago as well. This was a time when Paris was the centre of the high fashion world, and it's intriguing that she, um, uh, that she was breaking into that. Now, she was responsible for a number of innovations. If you, um, if you know the fashion world today, it's hard to imagine it without the catwalk, that was, um, that was an innovation of um, Lucy Duff Gordon. She uh, introduced the idea of the mannequins and the catwalk models. She gave whimsical names to her collections as she introduced them, um, happiness and so on. Um, she also uh, had a very soft romantic touch, and we'll see that in some of the dresses that we look at. But she also showed a very forward-looking embrace of the modernity that I referenced earlier that was starting to come into fashion. For example, she, like Paul Poiret, was one of the designers that looked at discarding the corset and instead, um, instead uh, 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 adopted boning um, in the bodice of dresses as one means of support. Uh, she also, while she loved the soft romantic tones of the um, late Art Nouveau period. She also looked to the, um, uh, to the Orientalist fashions that were coming into, um, uh, coming into uh, popularity through the work of designers like Leon Baxt and the Ballet Russe. That centre garment we see there, the peacock dress, on the left, that's a Les Modes, um, 
photograph for when it was first introduced in 1910. And in 1912, she had readapted it for um, uh, her new collection. And it was that model there, uh, the sketch we see, that was with her as she embarked on Titanic with her husband, uh, Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon, a baronet, a Scottish baronet that she had married in 1900. Uh, the two of them were travelling incognito under the name Morgan uh, because she had business with her successful New York branch. So let's just take a, a brief overarching look at Edwardian fashion, because one thing I find in talking about Titanic fashions is people tend to think of the early Edwardian uh, period that dominates uh, the perceptions of what, um, what was worn. Um, very much that wasp-waisted S-bend silhouette that we see there in 1901 on the left, the Gibson girl with the bouffant hairstyle, the S-bend um, waistline, the bosom tending to be thrust forward and a bit monolithic, and of course the hips moved backwards by the style of the gown. The Edwardian period technically ended in 1910 with the death of Edward VII, but we tend to carry that period on until the 1914 and the beginning of World War I. And it's this late Edwardian period that really influences the fashions we're looking at today. In 1908, a new silhouette became, um, uh, became the, um, uh, um, the fashionable one pursued by designers um, in Paris and around the world, and it's a much straighter line. And we see that there in that, um, in that uh, Beckhoff David creation. Um, you can see that the, um, the bust, the waist, and the hip are very much de-emphasised. In fact, the waistline from about 1908 rises from its natural or even slightly lower than natural point that we see in the wasp waist 1901 silhouette, and it comes to just under the bust. This was influenced by the uh, class by classical designs, um, the directoire period. If you think of Jane Austen and um, and uh, that um, that whole early romantic era, it was in a sense a revival of that period. We also see, however, in addition to looking back to those classical designs and the, um, and the early 19th century, we also see up there in the top this rather racy little illustration from La Vie Parisienne, which gives you an idea of the kind of modernity that we're seeing emerge. These are women there in their slimline, tailored outfits um, in a bar. It's a bit racy, La Vie Parisienne was, but it does show you that the idea of women's emancipation was emerging. And of course, we're seeing the birth of the suffragette movement. A little later, a little later on, we'll talk about hobble skirts, but it's intriguing to think that suffragettes marched for their rights wearing hobble skirts, which were by their nat very nature confining. I've made a reference to the influence of Orientalist fashions. And of course, you know, there's a whole other discussion to be had about the kind of fantasies and colonization of the West of the East. But by the late um, by 1910, the Ballet Russe and uh, brilliant creative designer Leon Baxt had started introducing some of the motifs from um, traditional Russian folklore, but also looking towards the Middle East and uh, the Far East and even ancient history such as ancient Egypt for inspiration in his designs. Now, we'll see a lot of a very soft colour palette in some of the dresses I show you, but we're also seeing the emergence of some really bold and bright colours and these would continue to influence fashion into the Art Deco period. Um, Georges Barbier did that illustration there. This was the cover of Le Modes in uh, April 1912, the month the Titanic sailed. And you can see it's an absolutely, you know, exquisite illustration of some of these designs by Paul Poirot. The, the turbans, for example, very Orientalist um, in their nature, and even the design and layout of the... Um, the design and the layout of the um, the pochoir, the fashion plate. Um, he wrote later, Georges Barbier, who did this illustration, he was to write later about how strong and bold these colours were and also often some very strong contrasts. You could have a jade green with a, with a tangerine orange. And, of course, that goes into the Art Deco era. In fact, we're, we're really in 1912 almost seeing the beginning of Art Deco. This would all be interrupted by the war, but it's the seeds have been planted. So let's have a look at the, um, again, at the silhouette. Now, this is a, a much misunderstood garment, the, um, 
the, um, uh, the corset. We have to start with foundation garments. It's the beginning of all fashion. Today, we look at, we'd look at push-up bras if we wanted to look at what our modern fashion, um, uh, 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 modern fashion uh, uh, silhouette and influences are. In that time, it was the corset. Now, it's become a sort of um, shorthand in, um, in uh, uh, cinematography and in television shows and in script writing to show women being tightly corseted to demonstrate their suppression. We see it, you know, it goes back to gone with the wind, if not before. Now, tight lacing was indeed um, warned against in, pub in Victorian publications, but generally speaking, most women did not tight lace. And of course, it was to them pretty much as, as much a part of their daily dress as we would consider a bra today. Um, as most women would consider a bra today. Um, obviously not all women then and not all women now. But um, well-fitted, it, it was regarded as a supportive garment. And women, um, they swam, they played golf, they even climbed mountains, they rode horses. So not as suppressive as you would imagine. But as we can see, we've got the early silhouette there on the left with that lovely Art Nouveau, the lovely Art Nouveau tendrils in her hair and very much that S bend, the bosom thrust forward, the wasp waist, and the hips thrust back. By the by, the 19, by 1912 on the right, we can see that the entire silhouette, including the corset, it's now become more an underbust. But you can see that the hips. I mean, in, in the ridiculous exaggeration that we often see in advertisements and fashion plates, even now, they have rendered her hips non-existent, which obviously didn't happen. But the ideal, the ideal was to achieve that very straight line. The waist isn't emphasised, nor are the hips. You're looking at a very slim, long, straight line. So what did you wear under your, um, under your dress? Where did we go from the corset? So we'll start from the, the very basics, which is your chemise. Uh, over there, we have the chemise. These came in varying lengths. They were probably about knee height um, at this, by this period, generally speaking. And of course, you never wore a corset next to your skin. You put your chemise on. Over that, you put your drawers, which are um, bloomers, long, long, loose shorts. They have a split in the middle, and it was split so you could conduct your necessary ablutions. Over that, you put your corset, or if you chose in this period not to wear a corset, and women were starting to look at discarding them, you could choose something such as the um, brassieres that we see there. These were less about uplifting as a bra is today and more about suppressing. In fact, you'll notice in a lot of these illustrations, the bust is sitting a lot lower than it does today or it had earlier. Over this, you could wear a corset cover and a petticoat, a skirt petticoat, or you could wear a long petticoat um, as we see there on the right. And then we have the hosiery, uh, mostly black and white in this period, um, could be silk, uh, more commonly wool. Uh, by the 1920s and the introduction of rayon, there was a whole array of colours you could wear. There were colours in this early period. You could get, for example, some very striking red hosiery and there you could get embroidered hosiery, which was quite lovely. Unfortunately, you could also get hosiery that had been, um, the arsenic dyes had been used in. Arsenic dye in clothing had largely, was largely um, done and dusted by this point because, of course, there had been tremendous protests over its use in the 19th century. However, arsenic dyes persisted in uh, furs, in millinery, and also in hosiery. And there's at least one account of a death in the early years of the 20th century um, because someone wearing their heavily dyed with um, arsenic dyes hosiery next to the skin. Um, that direct contact enabled the arsenic to, um, uh, to poison the wearer. But if you wore black or white, you'd be pretty safe. So now we get into what is appropriate to wear on a ship. Now, I'll just read you quickly a list. Now, this was put together by a, um, just as today magazines give us capsule wardrobe advice on what to wear when you're traveling and how to get the maximum benefit from what you're wearing. <clears throat> So according to the Albury Banner and Wodonga Express, and this is a fairly typical kind of travelling um, steamship travel list for the era, you needed one good tailored suit for travelling, one dress afternoon costume with coat, en suite or a separate coat, one very serviceable hotel dinner frock, easily slipped on, inconspicuous but smart, 
One more pretentious frock for restaurant dinner and general evening purposes. Pretentious is the wording of the article. I didn't uh, editorialise that. Uh, one boudoir robe, one coat, which could be the same as the coat going with the afternoon costume. A good raincoat, several smart blouses, underwear, at least two pairs of absolutely comfortable and serviceable walking boots or shoes, dress shoes, slippers and bed shoes a second tailored suit for rough wear and bad weather, or a one-piece frock to be worn under a coat, or alternatively, a blouse and coat. So we'll go through all these items. And the first, of course, you'll notice mentioned twice um, was the suit. Uh, you might recognise that suit there on the left, which, of course, is the inspiration for James Cameron's uh, suit in uh, the opening scenes when, when Rose boards Titanic. Um, now, there's been a lot of discussion in fashion circles about whether or not it was wise to wear a um, light coloured suit in a work dockyard. And if you look at photographs from the period, although it can be very hard to discern the actual colour, most of them are dark, dark clothing, generally with a coat over it. However, as you see in that image there in the middle from 1914 Life magazine about to cast off, Evidently, they had no problem with wearing a light coloured suit, <clears throat> a light coloured suit in a uh, in a dockyard, in a um, uh, at the docks. Um, I found a charming article from 1910 in which it suggested that, of course, if you are seeing off your if your friends are seeing you off and you're on the decks of a departing ship, you want to be there in your prettiest frock with a bouquet of flowers in one hand, waving waving uh, your departures with the other. It then recommended, however, that you go to your stateroom and very quickly change into a very dark serviceable suit, preferably loose and well-worn, uh, which seems like very practical advice for comfortable travelling wear. Um, one of the, of the suits at the time, these are obviously, you could have um, summer weight suits. These are linen suits. I chose that because that image is nearly contemporaneous with the spring of 1912 when we, uh, when Titanic departed, but also because it's a lovely colour illustration of a navy suit, which was one of the recommended colours for travelling. Um, linen, of course, is more a summer weight. Serge is what is repeatedly recommended. It's a type of heavy duty woolen twill. And tragically, going through the lists of the recovered bodies from the Titanic, you find again and again that serge is the material that is used. And on the right there, we have a, uh, an illustration from the museum's uh, Samuel Hood photographic collection. And um, these are the kind of dark suits that uh, are appropriate for wearing. Uh, sure, they're also the kind of suit that you wear for walking out in the streets. Now, you've noticed probably that I've gone straight to um, walking out outfits and afternoon suits. Because you're inhabiting public spaces on a steamship, you would not be wearing house dresses or morning dresses. Okay, so the shirt waist. This is a very important article in an Edwardian woman's wardrobe. Um, the, there was the blouse waist and the shirt waist. The shirt waist is the more masculine tailored uh, shirt. The blouse is, as the name suggests today, more blouse on um, and often more feminine, soft and decorative. And so we have an array of them there, both um, uh, lace and material. You can see a lovely little sailor collar there on the upper left. Of course, sailor styles um, had been influential in fashion since the Victorian period. And um, some very, um, uh, very pretty decorative embroidered blouses. On the right, you can also see Sears and Roebuck was a very accessible catalogue. So we're not talking about high-end fashion. This is fashion as it has filtered down for mass distribution. So we're looking at some of the second or third class passengers, but it gives you an idea of the range of colour and also some of the details that were very uh, popular in Edwardian fashion. We'll see, see the decorative buttons on the, um, uh, on the necklines there. We'll see those repeated again and again in um, other clothing elements um, that we'll, um, we'll look at. And of course, the, um, uh, and of course the, high, um, the high collars. Now, um, washing um, faculties were somewhat limited on the Titanic. You could get your shoes shined, you could get your suits pressed, but because fresh water was uh, in limited supplies, in fact, even if you were bathing, you were bathing in seawater, um, you could not get things effectively laundered. 
And so you had to use little uh, tips and, and tricks. And one of them was to be changing your collars. Now, today, of course, we use all attached collars with our clothing, but back then, um, for both men and for women, detachable collars were very popular and you had them as an accessory, um, just as we might have lots of earrings or we might have lots of necklaces. You had a lot of different types of collars that you could mix and match. Um, there's an array of collars and a jabot and some um, vestes, the, in, the infill inset lace there at the front. Um, and you can see where they fit. See how the open neck blouse has space underneath. You're not wearing an entirely different shirt under that. You're wearing a collar or veste like you're, like you're seeing there in the middle. There's actually a tip for ocean travel um, in one of the newspaper sources I looked at that suggested you could even tuck these into your purse if you needed a quick fresh up you could easily fold up and tuck one of these types of collars in your uh, in your purse and then, uh, and then change into it for a quick refresher. So we'll just look at a couple of afternoon dresses here. Um, there on the left, we have the woman with her suit that has obviously come to, her lovely tailored suit, who has come to call upon her friend wearing a very smart, sleek afternoon dress. Again, all of these are repeating that silhouette that we talked about earlier where we're looking at very long straight lines and quite a high waistline. And she could very well be wearing one of those, um, one of those decorative collars that we just discussed there. Um, in the middle there, uh, another picture from the Sam Hood collection. Again, very um, quite casual and comfortable wear uh, in afternoon dresses. There's some lovely button detailing. That woman who is second from the right is, I suspect, wearing a, um, she's wearing a pullover probably over either a, um, a waist or a, um, it's possibly a one-piece um, one dress. Uh, but she has some very interesting button detail there on the uh, overdress and at the hem. There's some lace trim there as well. Um, decorative skirts. These were elements also ruffles were often added to skirts, buttons, ruffles, embroidery, all elements that were added to um, add interest to the skirt. And on the right there, we return again to Lucille and her fantastic uh, creations. This is very high end. So we're looking at these are pretty much across the classes here. Um, the Lucille gown is, um, is quite decorative, quite high end, but some of the same elements uh, repeated. Again, you can obviously see the button detailing down the skirt. And here we have the LaRoche uh, family. Tragically, um, uh, Joseph LaRoche there was lost in the um, was lost in the sinking. And his wife is wearing stripes were one of the bold patterns that we see. Um, they were used to affect in costuming in uh, the Cameron movie in that um, in that wonderful tailored suit. But here we see them in a day dress again with what would be a detachable collar and the button detail in the bust. And then tea dresses, which are a dressy form of afternoon dresses. We'll also look at tea gowns, a slightly different thing. But tea dresses, which are a slightly more frivolous kind of um, afternoon dress, much more delicate. Um, you weren't expected to be. Um, uh, going out in the street in these gowns, these are dresses that you were wearing for entertaining at home or taking taking tea, as the name suggests. And you have already that tunic over dress, which we will see repeated again through evening wear. And now, of course, the essential overcoat. Um, a lot of layering in this period, of course, particularly with ocean travel, where you were Inside uh, in a well-heated space, although I will say that one of the first class passengers did complain that the heating in her cabin had run amok during the maiden voyage. Um, but you're looking at fairly well-heated interior spaces. So of course you do need to put on warm clothes when you go out for an Atlantic crossing. And we see some, um, uh, there's a bit of speculation as to who these two passengers were and if indeed they are a couple. This is one of the photographs taken by Father Francis Brown. Um, uh, before, of course, the, the ship departed uh, Queenstown and uh, between Southampton, Sherbrooke and Queenstown. And uh, these are some of the only um, surviving extant photographs from the voyage. And you can see there uh, she is wearing an overcoat. She's also tied her hat on. Now, this was a trick used for both motoring and sea travel, is that, of course, if you are wearing a very large extravagant hat, um, or you're wearing a hat that's perched on a very buffant hairstyle, you need to tie it into place. And this is what she's done there. 
Um, on the right, we have some of the furs. Now, you're seeing a real cocoon coat, what was called the cocoon. You can see it's uh, narrow at the top and then it tapers down the bottom, almost shaped like a cocoon. Um, this um, silhouette for uh, evening coats would persist into the 1920s. Um, as far as furs go, yes, of course, there were many worn on the Titanic of various, uh, various degrees of expense. Um, one of the tragic stories, of course, is the um, loss of the Strauss as an elderly couple. He refused to go, Isidore Strauss refused to go before the younger men, and his wife, Ida, refused to leave without him. She was offered an opportunity to leave in her life, but she chose not to. But she turned to her maid, Ellen, and she gave her her fur coat and said, you know, you take this, I have no further use of it. And when Ellen later attempted to return it to the Strauss family, they asked her to keep it in memory of Ida. And now, of course, we come into um, evening wear. And um, I mentioned earlier that lovely soft pastel palette, and, of course, we see it reflected through all these designs. In that uh, Boise Sirs gown there, we get a good view of the train, which is an element that was popular in the evening dresses of this time. And uh, Shelley Zidzik, um, former president of the Titanic International Society, spent a lot of time uh, with survive Titanic survivors when they were still with us. And she tells the story. She was snowed in with Marjorie Newell, who was a young woman in her 20s, sailed on Titanic. Um, and she tells the story of how she and her sister Madeline liked to stand at the grand staircase and watch the women descend in their evening dresses. And as they came down the stairs, she could hear the slither of the silk in their trains coming down. And it's a very visceral and evocative memory that uh, Marjorie kept with her for the rest of her life. It was one of the memories of the Titanic that was most vivid for her. And you can see again that tunic style overdress that's worn. So you've got the colour coming through. And Cameron's designer, um, um, uh, Deborah Scott, made good use of this in the um, in designing dresses for the movie, where you see, for example, Rose with the red dress with the the um, the tulle, embroidered tulle black overdress, and the colour comes through. And we see that here, where you've got an embroidered, probably tulle overdress, and the colour of the pink blushing through. And there's another exquisite Lucille mount mantle. Uh, it's intriguing that while a lot of the uh, dresses are quite uh, high-waisted, um, you see that the um, evening coats are often, often have a low clasp, looking forward again to the 20s. And another element of this ensemble there that's looking forward to the 20s is the uh, bandeau and the aigrette that she's wearing. That's the band around her head and the egret feathers, the aigrette. Um, that almost looks to us like a cliche flapper outfit. You know, you see this in, in gangster, um, gangster and flapper outfits in costume stores. It's really more a holdover from the 1910s rather than the 1920s, and it's another gesture towards that Orientalism that I mentioned earlier. Now, of course, not everything was high-end evening fashion, and on the right there we have a... Uh, uh, a dress that's much more modest, probably would have been appropriate for a second-class passenger. This was made not by a um, couturier that was, or nor was it made at home as many of these dresses were. This was made by a local seamstress and actually has a little handwritten label in it that says for pickup Thursday. And but you can see that it's it's um, a lovely uh, raglan um, sleeve top lace. It's over a there is a silk. Um, uh, um, under bodice that actually has the internal boning in it so it is meant to be worn without a corset and of course a, um, a beautiful silk jacquard, uh, jacquard skirt but no train. Um, there is a lot of discussion around whether or not it was considered rather uh, vulgar to wear elaborate evening clothes on a ship. Um, a lot of etiquette um, writers counselled against it However, we do know from what uh, fashion writer Edith Russell um, said, uh, she wrote later about what a colourful crowd they were on board. And she also mentions very specifically that most of the men and the women did wear evening dress. Um, most implies that not everyone did, but um, certainly according to her, and she as a fashion writer would have been attuned to this, most of them did. And this is the kind of scene you'd see. This is um, very contemporaneous with, um, uh, with the Titanic voyage. You can see that all the gentlemen there are in white tie 
and you can also see the trained, uh, the trained evening gowns. I just wanted to briefly touch on a little bit of detail because everything we've seen so far has been um, the overarching, the, the pullback picture. Um, and let's just have a look at what some of that finer detail and embroidery looked like. Um, this is uh, from the Randy Bigham collection. Randy is Lucille's biographer and he's written and researched a lot about the um, fashions in the first class uh, passengers on Titanic. And you can see that exquisite ribbon flower work and bead embroidery on the bodice. Uh, there's also that the sprays of ribbon flowers were one of the signatures of Lucille's style and that very soft, romantic, diaphanous kind of effect with this embroidered tunic under the um, heavier underdress and that lovely sash in one of Lucille's signature colours. And on the right there, we have a belt um, that has uh, very fine seed bead um, uh, soutache embroidery throughout it and also diamantes lining the faux buckle. This again was another Lucille innovation in fashion. She started selling separate accessories um, so you could refresh your outfits without having to rework them or have an entirely new outfit. You could buy elements such as these elaborate belts and uh, having discussed it with Randy we believe that the dating of this uh, is a right around 1912. She introduced it, she was written up in Vogue um, and uh, some of the other fashion magazines at the time, and they mentioned the leaf designs on some of her belts. So we believe that it dates to right around then. Now we come to the notorious hobble skirt, and this is what Dana referenced in her introduction with Edith Russell. Now, Edith um, Russell, then Rosenbaum, she later um, anglicized her name. Um, Edith is a fascinating figure. She was a um, fashion writer and she was also a stylist and she was returning to, um, she was return, she was traveling to America with trunks full of dresses in the latest Paris fashions. And uh, when she asked a steward when the evacuation was underway, uh, whether they were going to transfer the luggage to the rescue, to, to the rescue ship when it arrived, he responded essentially that she could kiss her trunks goodbye. She was not going to see them again. And then arriving on deck, she uh, knocked a buckle off her shoe and looked down, couldn't find it, looked up and realised the gulf between the deck and the lifeboat that had been swung out for her to board. And that's when the exchange took place when she was told to board the lifeboat. And because she was wearing a hobble skirt, she essentially said, I'm not an acrobat, there's no way I can do this. Um, eventually, she was aided by two men to enter the lifeboat. Now, the hobble skirt makes its debut around 1910. It was popularised by Paul Poirot. He was later to brag that he had uh, freed the bosom, um, i.e. through discarding corsets, and had shackled the uh, ankles, as we see here. Um, it was not just evening wear, it was skirts, it was day dresses. It's an exaggeration of the tapered silhouette that had become popular from this period. And it was uh, the, the newspapers from about 1910, uh, 1910 through to 1912, around that whole period, are full of accidents that have been caused by women wearing hobbled skirts, you know, um, struggling to disembark from trains or step down or they can't get out of peril, they can't move fast enough. And you can see how that is here. The, 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 the central image there, it's sort of a, a sack race for women in their own clothes. It's humorous, um, as is the as is the, um, uh, the photograph there on the right, um, two men helping a woman over a fence, uh, which is part of a series of funny postcards that was published on this subject. But during the thing here, the Titanic, as Edith's case demonstrated, it actually had a very deadly seriousness. It might have contributed to uh, more um, events than um, we know the document. Uh, Renee Harris, the wife of a theatrical interpreter who went on to become a pioneering um, theatrical agent herself, she slipped on a grease spot on the grand staircase caused by a tea cake um, the, um, the day before the sinking and uh, slipped and broke her arm. But it has been speculated um, that she may have um, been prevented from being able to arrest her fall because she couldn't regain her, her, her poise with, um, with her legs so confined. Uh, and during the sinking, and this speculation is a bit tenuous, but it's certainly a possibility, uh, one of the first-class women who perished, Edith Evans, 
It's always been a bit of a mystery why she didn't get into a lifeboat. There are some romantic stories about her telling her friend, you go, I, um, I have, you have children waiting for you at home, I have none. However, they cleared all the women around that lifeboat. Now, possibly she was overlooked in the melee. It was very dark. It was very confusing. Possibly she was simply too frightened to enter a lifeboat, you know, 65 feet above the water, be lowered down into the dark Atlantic and leave a, 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 leave what seemed to be the comparative solidity of the Titanic behind. Or possibly, like Edith Russell, she too may have found it very difficult to navigate entering a lifeboat with her legs so confined. And now, of course, the hat. Now, um, you could do an entirely separate um, hour on hats alone. Um, there was a lot of discussion as to what was appropriate to wear on board a ship and the toque, which is the very narrow, um, sitting quite high on the head. You can see some examples down there on the, um, the left-hand um, image of the Sears uh, catalogue. The toque was considered to be one of the most appropriate hats for uh, shipboard wear preferably a nice soft black straw, very soft because it could be pulled down tightly over your head. It was easy to tie a scarf over it, as we see there on the right, to fix it to your head. And if, for example, you were sitting on a steamer chair, you could lean back and it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't um, uh, bang up against the back of your head. Uh, however, some women preferred brimmed hats at sea because they prote protected their eyes from the sea glare, the um, the light reflecting off the water. Um, I found one recommendation that if you were going to wear a, um, if you were going, if you really were that concerned about the glare, you might want to wear smoked glasses, which is a kind of, um, it, it's a precursor to sunglasses. But um, anyway, here are some of your options. Now you'll notice that feathers were very popular. In fact, uh, women wore entire birds. Um, draped over their hats or just a wing um, spread out as, a, as an almost architectural detail. In fact, so terrible was the massacre of um, sometimes endangered birds that there were societies formed in England and America for the protection of birds from the millinery trade. But as you can see here, we're still seeing a lot of um, egret feathers and ostrich feathers and uh, so forth. It was, there was a lot of discussion even into the 1920s in millinery books about the ethics of using uh, feathers in your hats. Um, large brimmed hats, again, we have a Lucille moment. She designed a fantastic hat for the actress Gaby Deslys um, in The Merry Widow, and it gave its name to a type of very large wide brimmed hat uh, adorned, with, uh, adorned with feathers. But you also have, you can see there, there are hats with uh, made of velvet, straw felt was considered a very appropriate material for winter or colder conditions because it's quite uh, it's quite warm but as i said a very soft straw was also uh, was also used even in um, even in winter for some of these designs and of course at the end of our day if you needed to relax between dinner and uh, between changing out of your daytime attire and before you dressed for dinner one of your options was the um, the tea gown and we have an example there on the left, and you can see they're a lot softer. And the centre one, in fact, they became so elaborate that it was a bit different to tell them apart from negligees, which thus the headline there, tea gowns or negligees. Um, this was an opportunity between um, to take tea in the afternoon, which meant that between where, changing out of your, day, your daytime attire and dressing for dinner um, or the evening, you had the opportunity to relax without a corset. And women took this opportunity to have um, to have tea, say around four o'clock in the afternoon, and it became a, a, an almost um, a ritual of relaxing and um, donning rather whimsical outfits. You know, they were they were in very soft, very floating colours. They were much less structured. Some of them had boning in them if you wanted that little bit of support, uh, but you you could um, engage it in some really pretty, soft, colourful outfits. It was also notoriously, of course, the time in which women um, met, their, uh, met their lovers or so the legend went. And once more, we, we again see um, designers and uh, fashionistas looking towards the East for inspiration, and the kimono becomes very popular. In fact, Lucille wore several layers off the Titanic, and one of them was 
a kimono. Um, the kimono becomes adapted into a rather generic term and some of them just look like robes. They bear no relationship to um, the traditional Japanese garment. But they were also importing a lot of uh, bona fide kimonos from Japan during this period. In fact, the uh, fashion house Bavani uh, originally started as an importer of oriental goods. And so popular did their kimonos become, they purchased a um, kimono production house in Japan and from there, they then branched into other fashion areas and the world of, um, the world of couture. Now, of course, um, not every room, uh, not, every, um, uh, uh, not every cabin, even in first class on Titanic, had its own ensuite. In fact, only a, only a small number did. There were shared bathrooms for, the, uh, for first class, second class, and third class. In third class, there were two baths, one for men, one for the women. Um, I don't think many people would be lining up for them. Um, you can imagine um, having to um, elbow your way through to have access. Um, you'd ask your steward to run you uh, run you a bath, and then depending on uh, on the um, uh, depending on the scheduling, you would hopefully have access. Now, magazines at the time recommended that one wear a nice robe, uh, a nice boudoir robe or um, some uh, déshabille uh, in order to make that progression to the um, shared facilities. And it was also recommended that you wear a very pretty little boudoir cap, which is what we see there on that nightgown in the centre. This is obviously very 18th century influenced. Um, it, looks, uh, it looks a bit like a mob cap. Um, ostensibly they were to protect your hair, but really they were more decorative. They're often very little lacy affairs with lots of pretty ribbons. Um, you can see there too with the nightgowns, um, they follow the general line of the, of the silhouette of fashion at this period. The other hallmark of 1912 um, lingerie and uh, boudoir wear is that it's becoming appreciated in its own right. And this was something that Lucille um, was a master at. She um, suggested that um, it should be covered with small bows because that was very exciting for men to um, undo them. But um, it was being appreciated. They were being appreciated now as beautiful objects in their own right. You see a bit of that in that nightgown there. This is not simply a functional item. You can see the embroidery and the ribbons. This is also a very decorative and pretty piece. And we'll just have a quick look at some accessories now. Women were always expected to wear gloves when they went outside. In fact, it was said that the hallmark of a lady was someone who did not leave the house until the last button on her glove was done up. It could take you a long time, particularly for evening, where it could take you upwards of 20 or 30 minutes to work your way into the very, very tight fitting gloves that were so fashionable. These days when we wear evening gloves, they tend to have a very high synthetic component and they're stretchy so you can just pull them on. Back then it was again one of those class distinctions that the more money one had, the better fitting one's gloves were. They were offered a very, very thin, um, uh, thin uh, leather. They might be for evening wear. Uh, glacé kid was the preferred option. Silk gloves were available, but they were not considered quite as right as, uh, as a very fine kid skin. Uh, for day wear, you could wear uh, leather. Again, suede was a popular option. Or, of course, there were some other materials um, such, as, um, such as cotton. Uh, the general rule of thumb, of course, with gloves is the shorter the sleeve, the longer the glove. So for evening wear, they were quite long. Um, and even for day wear, because we saw a lot of those uh, dresses and shirt waists, the sleeves are elbow length or even three quarter, which again is one of the innovations of this period. Um, but you would often see them, um, you would often see the, uh, the glove would reach the elbow. And there's a few examples of the handbags at the time. Um, you can see the unfortunate alligator paws there. And for evening wear, you've got soft velvets, um, embroidered and uh, silks and satins. And there's an extant example of a satin um, embroidered Edwardian one. And of course, shoes, much more functional there on the left with those um, Cuban heels. Uh, this is Sears catalog. I went through this particular 1912 issue and virtually all the heels that are demonstrated in there, uh, because this again is more um, working the middle class. 
they're more uh, functional heels, but then the slightly higher end heels there, you can see that wonderful waisted um, uh, um, Louis heel or French heel. And some beautiful, there's a lovely little colonial, a colonial revival example there with the buckle. That one is rather reminiscent of the shoes that uh, Edith uh, Russell knocked the buckle off when she uh, boarded a lifeboat. And these are, um, I think uh, you've got patent leather, kid leather, and also satin, as in down the bottom there with the bow. Just briefly on class differences. Um, as we've talked a lot about um, how fashion filtered down, um, you have the high-end couture, and it's basically the same designs, but of course with less luxurious materials and um, uh, overt attention to that detail. Uh, by the time you get to um, uh, by the time you get to third class, of course, a lot of women are making their own clothes as they would have been in second class. But as you can see there, this family, the Goodwin family, tragically, all these people were lost in the disaster. They um, are wearing essentially the fashions that we have been talking about. Uh, you can see Augusta there is wearing a um, she's wearing a shirt waist and a um, and a skirt. Of course, there were migrant uh, people that were not following the latest fashion. I've seen um, there are some photos, beautiful photos extant of some of the um, Irish immigrants who uh, were wearing what we would consider very high end 1912 fashion. But of course, a lot of women weren't. Um, you can see by the width of the skirt there on that woman in the foreground, it doesn't have the tapered silhouette. It harkens back to an earlier period um, and a more conservative style of dress. Um, also, they're wearing scarves without hats or they're not wearing hats. Um, and um, uh, you can see the shawls. All the women on board were advised to take shawls with them. It was an easy wrap. It was a way of layering, taking... Um, and uh, adding warmth or, or removing it. And uh, we see a lot of women taking those shawls into the lifeboats with them. And then finally, we come to the evacuation and um, what one wore off the ship. Now, um, you can see that image there from the sphere. There is a woman there in her nightgown with a, an overcoat over it. This image, um, it's quite a powerful one, and it is based heavily on what was worn, uh, what was described, um, uh, the, the descriptions of survivors. And you have, for example, a man there in black tie and evening dress. There were at least five male passengers that were recovered. Um, their bodies were recovered wearing evening dress. A lot of the bodies, um, the men, for example, you can see that they were wearing pyjamas, but they put a suit on over that. With the women, a lot of them, of all classes, most of the bodies recovered were, um, were third class. Um, simply because, of course, there were more, uh, more of them. Um, they had very clearly dressed warmly. They had enough. In fact, that was a comment that was made by one of the um, undertakers on the Mackay Bennett, one of the crewmen on the Mackay Bennett, uh, which was one of the ships sent out to retrieve the bodies. Uh, it was very evident to him that they had known what was happening um, and they had dressed appropriately and according to the, um, and according to the weather. And um, then we have Edith there. Um, this was her in 1953 when she went to America to attend the debut of, um, of uh, the, the Titanic movie with Barbara Stanwyck in it. Uh, regrettably, she took the dress, which she still had, that she had worn off the Titanic, and there is a photo of her with it in the background. Unfortunately, it doesn't go down far enough for us to see how tight the hobble skirt was. Uh, regrettably, that was lost her, in, when her luggage went missing uh, upon her return. And down there we have a photo by Bernice Palmer. Uh, she was a young passenger on the Carpathia who took the hand, a handful of the photos that we have of the survivors on board. And she made the comment that the women who came on board, the first-class women seemed to be very well-dressed, um, Many of them even had their hats on and she said, you know, it was so striking that even in a sinking ship in the middle of the North Atlantic, one had to dress appropriately. But the other thing she said, and this was a very striking, um, provided a very striking image, is that she said that so many of them were wearing very obviously oversized overcoats and they were men's overcoats. And they were the coats of the family members, their brothers, their fathers, their husbands that they had had to leave behind. And that had been a last gesture. They had put a coat on their loved one for warmth, 
and they had put them in a lifeboat and they had sent them on their way. And that brings us to the end of our Titanic journey. And I'd just like to quickly acknowledge Randy Bigham, um, who is the author of We Still Her Life by Design. Um, he has provided uh, many, much of the information on Lucille here, and I know we always enjoy talking about uh, the ins and outs of steamer fashion, what was and wasn't worn, and uh, who invented um, who invented uh, uh, culottes for women first, and uh, interesting topics like that. And uh, Shelley Zedzik, who provided that wonderful little anecdote about um, the silk trains um, trailing behind their owners on the grand staircase. And so with that, I'm just going to call Dana back and um, we'll move on to our Q&A. Well, thank you very much, Inga. That was a, an absolutely fascinating exposition of a day in the life of clothing, really, uh, worn on board uh, the Titanic. I do have several questions and I will start off with um, a question from Jacqueline who says, who asks how much would be spent on these clothes? We saw the gloves there were one American dollar. Um, obviously, <laughs> you look through a lot of the catalogues. What would um, the passengers be paying for these items for their wardrobe? Well, it's 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 basically at every price point, and it's one of those very difficult. You'll see calculators where they equate, um, you know, what uh, a nineteen twelve dollar to a um, two thousand and twenty one dollar means, and it depends. Mm -hmm. It really is very hard to equate them because, of course, you're looking at buying power. You can look at historic currency rates, but it's very hard to actually put a dollar value on what the what the buying power was. So we're essentially looking at every different price point. I mean, um, there are some that would come. I'll try it. Hang on. Oh, I don't have. I did have some conversions written down. Um, some of the things, uh, which are the, the Sears catalog, is what we're looking at at the lowest end. Um, that would be, uh, uh, and these are out of objects that you could buy yourself rather than make. Um, the Sears catalogue, which is where you would have seen some of those prices pop up, um, one dollar is, you know, you're looking at um, uh, 12, 20 dollars. You know, this is well within, um, uh, in terms of buying power today, uh, well within that kind of um, easier budget. But then, of course, you go up to the haute couture gowns and they would be the equivalent today of thousands of dollars. There is, I mean, yeah. I suppose it's compared to the basic wage. I mean, obviously, yeah, it, it, that's one of the measurements we use. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, I, there's there's actually a very good site. Um, I don't know the address off the top of its head, but it actually provides at least three different um, measurements by which you can try to compare a, a, a figure from that period to now. But essentially. Um, it depends on what you're looking at. Catalog items, $20, $30, $50, you know, for a, for a complete outfit, you'd be looking at the equivalent of maybe in modern dollars, 50 to, uh, you know, 50 to 100 days terms. Um, but if you're looking at a haute couture piece, one of the Lucille gowns, you're looking at the equivalent of thousands today. High fashion. And yeah. another question here from an anonymous att attendee. Uh, did the ladies wear makeup? On board. Um, question. Good question. Um, yes. Um, no. The, the 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 key to makeup, and um, this is uh, one thing that I know a lot of historical programs get wrong, is that they make obvious. They make make makeup quite obvious. Now, women have always worn makeup. You can go back to ancient Egypt. Um, you know, they 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 reddened their, their lips. They brightened their eyes. You know, they they um, uh, they have through means we have always applied some product to change our appearance however the key in um uh, in the edwardian period was discretion one would wear possibly a little bit of powder um lipstick was on the verge of becoming popular and of course by the 1920s makeup was being applied publicly but you know it had to be done very discreetly um, a bit of rouge, but again, very delicately applied. So this is uh, when you see Titanic movies or um, any period drama where women are very wearing very obvious makeup, um, a, a, a quote unquote real lady would not have done that. Um, but uh, yes, there were always aids to beauty. <laughs> there always have been. 
And you did run through the 24 hours, but Monica has asked how many changes of clothes would a woman in first class have worn each day? You, you often see the figure, you often see the figure given up to uh, seven changes of clothing. Now, aboard ship, I don't think it would be quite that many. This is um, if you're doing quite a few activities. Um, there were certainly a lot of changes. So you would get up, you'd have your morning wrapper on, then you'd put your foundation garments on, and they'd remain largely unchanged through the day be pretty solid you're not getting in and out of your um in and out of your um uh, three or four layers there but then of course you'd have a morning dress again you would be more likely to wear a suit at sea you wouldn't be wearing say for example a house dress as you would if you were at home um and then you would you know you might change for lunch then you might change into an afternoon dress uh then you might might have you know relax in your tea gown or you might just change for dinner and then, of course, you would change out of that into a um, uh, into a, um, a negligee, and then you might change into your nightdress. So, the figure often given is up to seven changes, but I think that's the extreme the, the extreme edge of it. But you are looking at several changes throughout the day. Now, a question from MJ: Since laundry was infrequent, and I'll mould two questions here: one from MJ and one from Jackson. Um, what sort of cleaning products were used on clothing, especially evening wear, perhaps on board? But the other question is: If um, someone, if a woman or a passenger lost their clothing or their scarf or their hat or their gloves overboard, um, were there any um, stores or shops on board from okay. which one could buy these things? Okay, cleaning is, uh, this is one of the most fascinating subjects. Uh, there's, there's some wonderful texts about home economics in this period, and they have pages of instructions on how to clean. And because I uh, deal with a lot of vintage clothing, I read them avidly because a lot of these things you can't wash. For example, sequins at this time were gelatin, and they were often used as an embellishment in evening clothes. But um, and seed beads, they were lined with pigments, but if you wash them, they washed out and stained the colour. A lot of the colours used weren't colour fast either. Some clothing was washable and it was advertised as such, um, you know, washable silks and, and washable garments, but a lot of it had to be dry cleaning techniques. Um, and they had various means of dealing with it. For example, if you had mud on your hem and given you were wearing long gowns and there were unpaved roads and sidewalks, you were probably going to get mud on your hem. Um, you'd have to wait to dry and brush it off. But there's lots of techniques they used for, um, you know, cleaning lame, metallic fabrics, for cleaning feathers, for cleaning fur. Fur, for example, you'd um, use oatmeal, run it through, it would absorb the oils and the... Um, and the dirt, and then you, you know, leave it in, say, a pillow sack, rub that in, and then you could brush it out. It was, there were techniques of dry cleaning. Um, so, yeah, there were lots of techniques that they, um, that they used to clean clothes. One of the reasons that you changed so often if you had enough money was um, to, um, to um, uh, 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 keep yourself neat and clean. Uh, in terms of evening dress, because it was so delicate, as I say, there are a lot of uh, fabrics there that really were not washable and in fact could destroy your dress if it came near contact with water. There was there were some dry cleaning chemicals at the time, not as extensively used as we do now. So often these dresses had a very short shelf life. Um, and um, you did not wear them, you did not wear them um, extensively because they really could not um, they really could not be cleaned effectively as we know now. Well, I think this is something you could probably publish an entire a treatise on, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is. It's a, cleaning is fascinating. You, there, there are the way they treated different materials. It's 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 absolutely you know it's a fascinating um, it's a fascinating subject. And the second part of that question was it's about uh, stores on board or outlets on board whereby you could purchase. Yeah. Titanic uh, didn't have yeah. Titanic didn't have what we think of the modern stores that we see today in uh, liners, uh, in uh, cruise ships. The barber shop had a few things you could purchase, but not really clothing items. That's something that came um, into effect in liner travel later than the Titanic's period. Um, so really, you, you weren't too fortunate. If you lost your hat, you lost your hat. Right. And now Suzanne has a question about first class female uh, passengers. Did they use hairdressers or maids to wear those Big extravagant hats, or did they? Excellent, wear excellent question. Um, uh, a lot of the first class passengers did travel with their maids. I think I mentioned uh, Ellen Bird, who was um, Ida Strauss's maid, um, or they had to dress their own hair. Now, 
of course, um, while the hairstyles weren't as elaborate as they were in the early Edwardian period, they still required a bit of volume. You, um, uh, Marcel waving had been invented, permanent waving had been invented, but they could be a bit dangerous. So what women would do would be they um, either dress their hair themselves or if they were first class, they would have a maid or a stewardess assist them in dressing their hair. Um, they were quite trained in how to do ladies' hairstyles. You um, used what were called hair rats to build up the volume. Um, this was when uh, you could either purchase rats or you could save your own hair when you brushed it out. And you use that to achieve that, that fullness or techniques like that combing, um, just as we did in the 60s. Uh, you could also buy, um, um, uh, you could buy um, uh, tresses as well um, to plump up your, your hairstyle. Um, but uh, yeah, yes, uh, it, it helped if you had a lady's maid to do. Dressing could take a long time. Okay, I just have two more questions. We have very little time left, so if you can you know, give it your <laughs> brief <laughs> attention. How did these styles, this is a one woman, a female, very much a female fashion question. How did, from an anonymous um, viewer, how did these styles change to accommodate pregnant women, especially with the boning? Oh, good. Did they um, try very, to hide pregnancy or did they embrace Very good them? question. Pregnancy was uh, tended to be understated. Believe it or not, there were corsets that were specially uh, made for pregnant women. Um, it was believed, and uh, I think this is one instance where um, I don't think the, the gynecological evidence is in support of it, but it was believed that a corset could actually support you during pregnancy. Um, you also had garments. Some of them were made a bit adjustable, so you could expand, particularly with the corset, so you could adjust it as your pregnancy advanced. Um, you were... Expected, you know, they, they were um, slightly less tailored, slightly more, you know, they, uh, obviously um, uh, you could not completely conceal the fact that you were pregnant and it was a recognised part of life. But really it was more um, putting a little hidden adaptation so the dress could, the dress could be uh, let out as, you, uh, as your pregnancy advanced. Okay, a question from Peter and perhaps our last question. Um, we, you spoke of a lot about fashion reflecting the onset of modern fashion from the era we know as the Art Deco era, as well as, um, of course, the influence of the East. So Peter is wondering to what extent the fashion on the Titanic highlights breakdowns in class distinctions during the era, and if the ship itself was built with greater consideration for second and third class passengers. Um, theoretically, yes. I mean, it's a bit, um, it, it's become a bit of a, a, a common cliche among, line of, um, uh, among Titanic enthusiasts to talk about the fact that, you know, third class on Titanic was um, as good as second or first class had been on earlier ships. And to an extent, that's true. Um, and it was still, as I say, you know, you're still looking at the fact that they only provided two, um, uh, two <laughs> bathtubs for the entirety of third class. But on the other hand, you know, you were given, um, you know, there was very good food available. Um, there was a bit of, there was segregation. Families could, um, had cabin accommodation together, whereas um, uh, there was a, a gender separation, um, ostensibly for the protection of women. But, you know, you had the, you had women and men were housed very far apart in terms of accommodation. Uh, we're starting to see the, the democratisation of fashion in the sense that um, it really becomes much less easy to distinguish between classes. And this is generally speaking, not just classes on ocean liner travel. It doesn't really happen until 1920s and you get that real simplification um, and the, the very, you know, the, the, um, the shimmer style dresses of the 1920s and very straight lines and, and a much simpler fashion, which there were complaints made in the, uh, in the 20s by um, style snobs that it, it was now impossible to tell, you know, what class anyone was because women, you know, women, you know maids dress the same as their mistresses. Um, in the night in 1912, it's beginning to happen, but it's still very evident. Um, uh, it's still very evident if you're attuned to the nuances of the women who have um, clothing that is made of more expensive materials that is extremely well tailored and well cut versus things that you might make yourself. Mind you, if you were a very talented home seamstress, and a lot of women were, it would be more difficult to tell the difference um, in class. But of course, you know, when it comes to things like, you know, being able to afford um, some of the more um, uh, luxurious textiles and hats and so on, so on, 
it becomes uh, class distinctions become more readily apparent. All right. Well, thank you very much, Inga. I'm afraid we are going to ha have to wrap up now. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, this is, of course, one of our series from our History at Home um, talk series. And coming up, we have more delights for you. So please join in every Tuesday, 4 to 4.45. The next um, this talk is by our maritime archaeologist, Dr. James Hunter, who's going to be discussing the South Australian, which is um, an, a, shi a ship associated with really the early uh, colonial culture of South Australia, uh, the colony of South Australia, and it was wrecked in, in 1837. So James will and Professor Holger Deuter will uh, walk you through that in a graphic novel they're exploring and, and investigating. So please join us then. Again, thank you very much for attending today. <laughs>